Good morning. Thank you for coming to join us. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm going to be talking about smell, also known as the sense of olfaction. And I'm just going to start by telling you a story about a patient of mine, and we'll call him Steve. So I saw Steve in my clinic eight years ago. And about six months before he came to see me in my clinic, Steve had had a really bad flu. It had laid him low. He was in bed for almost a week. And the morning that he got up and he was ready to get back to life, he went and made himself a cup of coffee in the kitchen, a morning ritual that he loved. And instead of smelling that warm, rich, inviting aroma that we all are so familiar with, he instead smelled a kind of chemical burning type of smell. And when he went to taste it, it smelled like, or tasted like paint thinner to him. And then worse is what happened next. His wife walked into the kitchen, and as she approached him to give him a good morning kiss, a stench of what he described to me as the smell of rotting flesh came with her. Really repulsive. So that was disconcerting, but... <laughs> But he figured, you know, I've been really sick. I'll give it some time. I'll just wait for this to improve. Unfortunately, as time went by, it did not improve. And in fact, it worsened to the point where he really couldn't stand being in the same room with her. He tried to habituate himself by sitting next to her. That didn't work. He tried to go to the doctor, and his doctor told him this sounded maybe like a psychological issue. And Unfortunately, you know, Steve loved his wife. They had been together 40 years. They had two adult children. But he, as you can imagine, started spending less and less time in the same room as his wife. And what that led to was his wife and his two adult children coming to the conclusion that Steve was having an affair. Because who had ever heard of a problem like this, right? And so by the time Steve got to my clinic, Unfortunately, divorce proceedings were already underway. His kids weren't really speaking to him that very much. And he really felt like his life was crumbling before his eyes. Eight years ago when I saw Steve, I had just graduated from my amazing fellowship here at Stanford. And I had felt so prepared. You know, I thought any sinusitis patient that comes to see me, I can fix them. Any skull based tumor, I can go and take that out. But this type of patient, like Steve, we really didn't have very much to offer, unfortunately. Neither to him nor the stream of patients that followed that had completely lost their sense of smell, like chefs from Michelin-starred restaurants or wine sommeliers or even just day-to-day -day people who realized that suddenly they could taste no flavor in their food. And not to take anything away from the taste lecture we're about to hear, but as you may know, you know, other than the basic salt, sugar, sour, et cetera, the flavor of our food is really dependent on our ability to smell it. So the good news was, is I had just finished my ENT residency also, and I was familiar with the idea of losing a sense and being able to bring that back to people. And I also was familiar with the idea that David talked about this morning, the landmark paper in 1998 that showed that contrary to centuries of what we thought about the brain, the adult mammalian brain does actually create new neurons. And one of the major centers of neurogenesis in the adult human brain is the olfactory bulb. And so I knew all I had to do was figure out how to switch back on that inherent regenerative property that all of our olfactory systems already have. So I went on a search, and I ended up in Europe because I heard about something called olfactory training that they were trying and seemed to have good results with. And it was really using that same principle of just retraining your brain. And what I realized was the type of training they were doing was in very sort of rigid research protocol type settings using very, very expensive, you know, isolated pure odorant molecules. And although it was very interesting, it didn't seem scalable to a patient population. So what I did was I brought it back, that idea, and I wanted to test it in a real life parameter. And sure enough, after a four year randomized controlled trial, multi-institutional, of having patients do olfactory training on their own, at home, with very inexpensive scents, we were able to show that people were able to regain their sense of smell and taste 30% more people than otherwise would have been able to. 
that was great. After some more years of research and studies, trying to get medications to the olfactory cleft while they were doing that training, I was able to get that number up to 50%. Now compared to eight years ago, sometimes 50% feels great. But unfortunately, you know, when I'm sitting in the clinic and I'm sitting with a patient and they're not in that 50% and they still have no ability, it doesn't feel really good. It feels kind of dismal. And so that's when I realized I really had to shift my focus to the lab. And that's what we're doing now. Now I understand, we need to understand the underpinnings, the safety and efficacy of new exciting technologies like you've heard about already, specifically electrical stimulation, because there's no reason why if we can stimulate the end organ in the ear or the end organ of the eye and get those signals to the brain, there's no reason we can't do that in the nose. So that's what we're trying now. And of course, my goal, like all of you in this room, is that one day when every single patient that comes into my office has a problem, I have the answer for each one of them. Thank you. <laughs>